Good morning. Butch Eichel's The Country Church, Marion, Texas. A short drive to worship the Lord in a relaxed atmosphere. Good morning. If you'll take your Bible and open it to the book of 1 John. Go all the way over to the book of the Revelation and go left. First John 1, first four verses, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Let's pray. Father, we again thank you for the privilege that we have to be in your house today. We thank you for your word, for what it means to us. Pray for our worship time. Pray for Dave and the praise team as they lead us. Pray for our pastor as he'll come to proclaim your word. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, draw men and women to yourself and that you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. And how appropriate. Great is thy faithfulness. Appreciate Beverly playing here in the absence of Ruth Ann is there out. And thank the Lord for it. It's always good to have our missionaries here, and the Nichols are here with the Calvary Commission. I just saw you right there. We are right back here. Thank the Lord for them and all that they do. Well, this morning in 1 John, we begin a new chapter, a new pilgrimage, if you will. And these first four verses, <coughs> we've entitled that all might know. And as we begin this journey, we need to learn a little bit about the writer that God used to bring this message across. The Apostle John, and some people refer to him as the Apostle of Love, because everything that he preaches about and teaches about centers around the Lord Jesus Christ and his love. In the Gospel of John, he doesn't talk about I or me, but instead he refers to himself in the third person as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And he's caught up in the fact, he's overwhelmed with the fact that God is love. And that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Caught up in the fact that while we were yet in our sins, feeding on the bottom, that Christ loved us and died for, him, for us. And this awesome God, this lovely Lord Jesus, loved him. You ever get caught up in that? Because if you do, you're on your way to moving from a religion to a personal relationship with a living Lord. You ever <clears throat> notice that some people don't want to get pinned down to what the Word says about God? In other words, they don't want to have a biblical perspective they want to form their own picture of God. Who he is, what he does, what he overlooks. And these people never get a biblical picture or perspective of who the Lord is and what he's about. How many times have you heard somebody say, well, I don't believe God would do this. Or I believe that God thinks this way. Well, let me tell you something. You better find out from the Word of God about the God of the Word. Amen. And John just does that. So we want to try and gain and grasp a biblical perspective and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Notice how he begins in the beginning. <laughs> that which was from the beginning. In John's gospel, the first chapter, the first verse, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I don't know about you, but in the beginning kind of blows my mind. I mean, I mean, you look it up in the dictionary, and it says the point by which all things originate in the beginning. My, my question is, where's that? And I, I think about when we were constructing or building this auditorium. It, uh, it was being designed and Phil and I entered into an in-depth scientific experiment. <laughs> what? Why do you laugh? <laughs> and uh, we were considering the size, and so we got into this great big room, this great big warehouse. And I told Phil, I said, get that folding chair there. And I'm standing on one end, and you get the folding chair, and you keep going back. And when he finally got far enough back that I couldn't see the facial expressions, I said, now move up one. <laughs> and that, scientifically, is the size of this <laughs> auditorium. Voila! We now had a measurement. We had a place to start from that was measurable. But in the beginning is something else. My, my little finite mind can't grasp. And the only thing that helps is in the beginning, God. And so this changes it all. This, this adds meaning to it. It adds purpose. Because when you have God in the equation, it gives you a sense of reason and sensibility and security. <clears throat> and... I do a little mental gymnastic deals because in the beginning, God, and <clears throat> the Bible talks about the Lord Jesus Christ speaking it all into existence. And, and I, I kind of start right where we're at in Marion, and I go back as far as I can in the New Testament. Then I go into the Old Testament. Then I go all the way back to Genesis. And when I get as far over here as I can get, I put down a little stake and Jesus comes out of eternity past to my stake. In the beginning, God, greater than us, the originated all of it by him and for him. Well, John writes, that which was from the beginning. And now he talks about the experience, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, and I, I underline that, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have gazed upon, looked upon, <coughs> and our hands have handled of the word of life. In other words, we have the written word that validates, and we have the testimony that personalizes it. And John does that. You see, Romans 10, 17 talks about when you have heard. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. John said, we've heard about him. We've heard about this Jesus. But that's not all. We've seen him with our own eyes. We've looked upon him. We've observed him. Peter, James, and I went up into the Mount of Transfiguration to be with him. And we saw him in all of his Shekinah glory. I mean, what a splendor it was. What a, what a wonder it was. <coughs> John doesn't tell about it, but Peter got so excited. He said, Lord, let's build three houses. Let's build three churches, one for you and one for Moses, one for Elijah. God spoke from heaven. This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. And it says they saw no man and everything. It was Jesus. Caught up in him. Well, but that's not all. We've seen him with our own eyes. We've 
looked upon him. We've observed him. And our hands have handled. In other words, <coughs> we have firsthand experience. You see, James and I were mending nets. And we were commercial fishermen, and that's fishermen, and that's part of what we did. <coughs> Excuse me. We were mending nets, and Jesus came, and he called, and we dropped our nets, and we followed him. And he said, don't be afraid, but from now on, you're going to be catching men alive and not just fish. And we left it all behind, and we followed him in his way. Excuse me. Now, once, when Jesus was praying to his heavenly Father in John 17, and I, I always have to plug this in because sometimes when you ask people, "Have you, uh, uh, you want to share with me the Lord's Prayer?" and they say, "Our Father which art in heaven," no, that's the model prayer. The disciple said, "Lord, teach us to pray," and he said, "After this manner, pray ye." But if you want to hear the Lord's Prayer, and then John 17, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, his prayer to the Heavenly Father for you and for me. And John says that he was praying for us, and then he said, Neither pray I for these alone, listen carefully, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Praying for all of these which shall believe on me through their words. In other words, not only have we had this experience, John is saying, but you can have it too. Not only do we have the love and the privileges, but you can have it too. It's not something that's just for us. Do you know that there are some organizations that if you share any of their secrets, you do so at the risk of your own health? But you know, that's what's different about Christianity. The more you give it away, the more you have. The more you share it, the more you shout it from the rooftops, the better off you are, the more blessed you are. Well, John talks about the experience, but he talks about the purpose also. <clears throat> For the life, the life of Christ was manifested. We have seen it. We bear witness and we show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. For the life was manifested. In as simple as I can make it, <clears throat> John never got over Jesus. Isn't that something? He never got over that experience. He never got over the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and just recently, we went to Alaska, and I was telling my fish story, and then Larry had to tell me about his, and the first liar never has a chance. I mean, it <laughs> just gets worse, but uh, we went rainbow trout fishing, and the first time I'd ever been fly fishing, and what an experience. Uh, I, the, the trip was wonderful, and we had a guide and his name was Dave. And, and really, he should have been a praise and worship leader. Maybe there's still a chance for him. <clears throat> because I've never seen anybody that enthusiastic. Uh, every trout that Keith and I caught, he said, oh, wow, you got a big one. Oh, how, hold on, hold on, you can bring him in, old man. What is it? And every trout, every day, every guide, and every year that he was in, he was excited about every experience. And I mean, it was genuine. Uh, it, it wasn't something that he was just faking or getting into. Every, every, it was just, just a delight to him. Well, the question arises, 
One, have you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ personally? In other words, have you been saved? And then secondly, if you've truly been saved, have you ever gotten over Jesus? You know, some, sometimes people say, well, I, I just need a revival. Man, head down the road, put on some gospel music, draw a little circle, and you can have a spell right where you're at. You know, get caught up in him. All I have to do is think about where he's brought me from, where I could have been, and where he's brought me to. You know, we don't have to sing three songs and give up, take up an offering. <laughs> I can still get excited because it's all about him and getting caught up in him. Uh, when I was saved, Joan and I were attending church and in this church was a, a young airman that was at Randolph Air Force Base. This has been over 50 years ago, and I remember it like it was yesterday. The young airman's name was Henry Smith. Some of you guys can look up and see if Henry's still alive, but uh, they'd ask Henry, he said, Henry, he said, uh, what do you think heaven's going to be like? Boy, his eyes would roll back in his head like a chihuahua, and he'd just say, man, I think it's going to be one. I, I think it's going to be like Six Flags, and there's going to be rides everywhere, and it's just, boy, it's going to be so thrilling just to be there. Years later, I realized that Henry's theology wasn't all that solid, but his enthusiasm was. <laughs> he was excited about heaven and excited about seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. And so should we be. Amen. Somebody comes up and says, what happened to you? I've been saved. <laughs> what? I was saved. I was thinking deep in sin, far from the peace for sure. And all this other thing. My goodness. You look like you're trying out to be a cruise director on the Titanic. I've been saved. I accepted Christ. I've never got over it. It's a wonderful thing. Well, Henry's reply, his enthusiasm about heaven, about the Lord. John says, for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life. Now, we show unto you that eternal life. In other words, how you can be saved and, and know it. And how can we be saved and not share it? I think of Acts chapter 4. Uh, Peter and John were ministering in Jesus' name. And the scripture says that they were unlearned and ignorant by the world's standards. But one thing is certain. They could tell that they had been with Jesus. In spite of everything else, there was something different about this, these two. And the something was someone, and the someone was Jesus. They could tell that they had been with Jesus. Now, it doesn't stop there. They, they commanded them. Don't speak in Jesus' name. We got some of that going on today. You're going to offend people. You know, that's not politically correct. And they told them, this is not something new. They told them way back then, don't. We threatened them, don't speak in Jesus' name. Now, I love the answer. Peter and John, they said, Unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, that's something that you can judge. But we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We can't help it. We want to share about Christ Jesus. Now, this isn't a holy pep rally. We can have some down days. And if you haven't had any down days, then they're fixing to come. <laughs> You've either had them, you're in them, or they're a coming. 
one way or the other. And they've happened to all of God's people. Amen. Jeremiah, he, he had a desire to see lives changed, and he shared about the Lord. And all they did was make fun of him. And they ridiculed him. And Jeremiah said, I'm not going to talk about him anymore. I'm not going to make mention any more of his name. But his word was like a fire in my heart. As a burning fire shut up in my bones, I was weary for forbearing, but I couldn't keep from it. That's what he says. Because he had experienced the living Lord. This is what... John is saying, now that I've experienced salvation, I've experienced eternal life, I can't help but share it with you. From time to time, somebody on the outside will refer to people on the inside as the hypocrites in the church. I'm not going into that church because of the hypocrites that are in it. But let me tell you, if this was a hypocrite and I'm going to hide behind it, I'm smaller than the hypocrite myself. But I always answer by saying, you're right. You're right. I'm one of the biggest hypocrites of all. Oh, now, but I'm pretty sure I wasn't talking about you. I said, no, I am. Because I know what it is to be saved. And I know what eternal life is all about. And I haven't really talked to you about it. So I'd like to do that right now. Oh, whoa, this is another ball game here. <laughs> so, John speaks of a partnership. And in verse 3, he said, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So John's not writing to get another notch on his gospel gun. He writes wanting them to not only be saved from the wrath to come, but that they might really and truly experience fellowship. Not just friendship, but a fellowship that comes between two born-again believers. There's nothing like it. I had a friend that I grew up with in Marion, and we were close. We were close in those days, in the olden days. We did not have Green Valley water. We did not have a rural water system. We had cisterns, and they were, they, everything was really sanitary. Uh, what happened is when, when it rained, you let the you cut off the gutter and and it washed the roof then you flipped it back on and it caught the water now that was early days of purification here <laughs> and so we had these cisterns and so water was at a premium and my buddy and I I had to be careful how I say this we took a bath in the same water, not at the same time, <laughs> but in the same water. And we'd flip to see who got to go first. Scared myself there for a minute. <laughs> and and we, were, we were close. Uh, I mean, we run the roads together. And sometimes one of us would blow out a tire. We didn't have enough money to buy another tire, not even another used tire. So what we did, we jacked up one car, took the tire off of one, put it on the other one. We kept one car rolling at all times. <laughs> Sometimes we didn't have enough gas. You ever heard of a siphon hose? <laughs> Fill it up. We kept gas in the deal. It, it, just to keep one car rolling. I mean, we were close. I could, I could go on and on and on and on and tell you how close we were. But then one thing happened is I found Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. 
And we had a wonderful friendship, but we had no fellowship. And he kind of, I didn't leave my buddy, but my buddy left me. There's a difference between friendship and fellowship. Well, I've always had friends. Proverbs 18.24 reads that a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I don't want to get in trouble, but I will. Somebody said, I don't know who it was, it wasn't me, said the reason the dog has so many friends, he wags his tail instead of his tongue. Well, moving on. <laughs> yeah, boy, got a little quiet on that one, didn't it? We had a lady that uh, I've, Joan and I've known for years, but uh, she would come and she'd come on Wednesday night and she would sit right in the dead middle of a row with nobody on it. And then she'd complain because nobody was friendly. I mean, you'd have had to pack a lunch to get to where she was at. I mean, uh, you know. To have a friend, you have to be found friendly. That's why Dave tries to get, introduce yourself to somebody, talk about Bible study, what, whatever it is, to get to know somebody. You, to have friends, you've got to be found friendly. Well... But there's a difference. Fellowship is way more. Fellowship with the Father and with the Son and with other believers. It seems like we ought to want that. Now, I'll be real honest with you. Forget about football season, but basketball's coming up. I don't hang with anybody that isn't a Spurs fan. I mean, I may tolerate them. They need to be saved and all of that. But uh, there's a fellowship there. Well, John's talking about Christianity. And he says that we're to have participation with, communion with, associating with, partaking with, partnership with the Lord. And then he speaks of the results. In verse, verse 4, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Your joy may be full, filled with joy, full of joy, not just happy, Joyful, where Paul says in Ephesians 5.19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. But as I studied this in the original Greek, it goes on to speak of our joy. Our joy, not just your joy, our joy. And it's a joint thing. You, you know what brings me joy? Is when your joy is full. That's, that's what the thought is here. When you're filled with joy because of the Lord Jesus Christ, it brings me joy. When somebody accepts the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and they're excited, I get excited. When I was in evangelism, I had to... I, I, uh, Billy Graham was coming to town. I didn't realize nobody else had any evangelistic meetings whatsoever. So I was out of work. And this one church asked me if I would come and preach for six, eight, twelve weeks or whatever it was there. And uh, so I went there and I preached. And, and man, the first Sunday about twelve people were saved. I mean, it was unbelievable. And a lady... I'm trying to think of the Greek term. I think it's hoity-toity. <laughs> but uh, she came to me, and she was decked to the nines. And she said, Reverend Eichels, 
Next Sunday, I'm going to get a clock and I'm going to put it in the back wall, on the back wall there so that you will know when it's time to quit. I said, sister, you do that. And when it gets 12 o'clock or whatever, I'll just tell people that they can go to hell because you want to get to Luby's on time. Well, in the length of time that I was there, we never had a clock on the back wall. Because nothing's more important than people coming to know Christ. Now, when you see people accept the Lord, it ought to bring a joy to your heart and to your life. You know why it does me? Because I think about when I was saved. And I just have a, a warm fuzzy all over again. Excited about it. Well, John says that your joy may be full, so our joy can be full. Your joy will double our joy. Isn't that something? Would you like a joy in your heart that passes all human understanding? That will enable you to sing in spite of the circumstances? This morning, the invitation's for you. I mean, you know it. God knows it. All of heaven is waiting for your response. This isn't something new. You've sat through it before. And some of you need to be saved. It's that simple. You need to bow the knees of your heart and agree with God, Lord, I'm a sinner and I cannot save myself. Would you come into my heart and life, forgive me of my sin and save my soul? And if you do, he will. Amen. And so there's a need for people to be saved. And some who are saved need to openly and publicly identify with him. Water baptism doesn't save anybody, but it's in response to obedience to God's word, identifying with Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And that invitation is to invite people to come and to say, I want to be identified with him. And some to plant their life here. You know it or will know it shortly. I think of the song... Would you have him make you free and follow at his call? Would you know the peace that comes by giving all? Would you have him save you so that you can never fall? Let him have his way with you. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and set you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see. It was best for him to have his way with thee. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. Father, that all might be, that all might hear, and that all might come. That you're not willing that even one perish, but that all come to repentance and faith and trust in you. And so, Father, we want to pray and trust your Holy Spirit to do a work that we're not capable of. We're not capable of saving anybody. We're not capable of drawing anybody to the cross. But, Lord, we know that your Holy Spirit does, can, will, if we'll just let you have your way. And so this morning, we pray for every heart that's here today, every note of the invitation. That, Father, that people would realize the word. That they'd recognize the Holy Spirit. And that they'd respond by just stepping out, letting go, and letting you have your way. And, Father, we'll be forever grateful, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.